me say that in farming or gardening, your it's like building a house. Your foundation is in the soil. If your soil's not right, nothing else will be right as 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 you go forward. So let's talk about getting our soils good, better than good. Let's have them so that whatever you do, you can, you, your outcomes are going to be number one on your outcomes. One of, the, one of the biggest things about starting with your soil is, and I know we got a, we got a giant in the room, but is your soil tilt or your, the friability of the soil. Putting your hands into it and being able to come in and come out of it nicely. It's soft, it's malleable, it's workable. That's your soil tilt. And there are things all around you that will help to make that happen. If, case in point one, since we've got a gentleman in the room with horses, horse manure is, is excellent when it comes to providing tilt in the soil, especially if you've got clay soil. Horses are not like ruminants, like cows that chew and chew and chew and break down and break down and break down. Their manure is more coarse. It's less, it's, it has less value than cow manure in terms of its mineral content. But the bulk and the roughage that it adds to the soil is very, very good. Would I compare it to cow manure? No, not, not in value for nutrients, but excellent for the roughage. If it's available, grab it and use it because it'll help to start loosening your soils. And then come back with your cow manure. Preferably if you're using manures now, let me, let me, let me preface that with, with a covenant here. If you're using manures, try to know something about the farm you're getting. Try to know something about the cattle that are being fed, how they're being managed, so that what you're receiving is not bringing you more trouble than, than you ever wanted. When I say that, um, I don't know if you, any of you remember years back ago, there was a Oprah Winfrey had a gentleman come on her program called, his name was Howard Lyman. Not to plug people. But on that program, she made a statement after Howard expressed to her how farm cattle management and ranching was going on. And some of the things that were happening with the feed, she says, you know what, I'll never eat a hamburger again. And the meat industry kept them both in court for years. She got out earlier because she had resources. Howard Lyman stayed in a much, much longer because of defamation of their product, etc., etc. But what Mr. Lyman was expressing is that in many bag feeds, because of the, the dollar or the price point, oftentimes blood meal, bird feathers, other animal products are added into the feed for cattle. And you know cattle are not carnivores, they're herbivores. So as a result, they're, they were drawing the, nex, the nexus to Crutchfield's Jacobs disease or mad cow disease. Now, as that disease develops, the proteins are, are changed and you have a byproduct called prions that are left behind in the soil, that are left, that are in the waste stream of the animal. And they have tried to destroy prions at 2,000 degrees. They will stay in your soil for years and years and years. And those proteins will bring that problem back to the person who that's the, that's the pathway of thought. Now, a lot of, a lot of research has been done about prions because, of course, there's a lot of cattle farmed in America. There's a lot of beef that's farmed and a lot of practices that are pretty consistent all around that industry. But for me, I'm encouraged.
encouraged because as farmers, all of us know that our hands, our work, and what we do is at the oversight of somebody bigger than us. Do you know that? Anybody know that? Yeah. For me, I know that my work, and what I do, and the conditions that I work in, I don't control the rain. I don't control the sun. I don't control the weather. But I know there's somebody that does. And his interest is in us, and that's all. So what it tells me is, is that if there's somebody overseeing what we do and overseeing what's happening around us, that a provision has already been made to counter issues that we're going to come across. Those prions, the, the research has shown that Humic acid or fulvic acid break down the molecular bonds, the DNA bonds of that protein, making it ineffective to do damage. Now, if I go buy, I can go, I can go out and purchase humic acid. I can purchase fulvic acid and apply it to my soil. It helps my plants grow well and do what they do. It's used often. But if I'm adding organic matter to my soil, I'm using composted materials. As composted materials break down, they create humic acid on the land. And, and for me, that's awesome. I don't have to go buy that product. All I have to do is follow a management structure of using organic materials. That's either dead leaf plant or chitin or otherwise bulk materials, and you have it in your alfalfa, you have it in your hay, you have it in your grasses, compost those things. If, if you have a way to pulverize it, to make the pieces smaller than like an inch or, or, or right about that area, put it into your soil. Blend it, incorporate it in your soil as you're rototilling or you're shoveling your, your, your garden beds. Get that matter incorporated into your soil won't do you much that first year, but except change the, the structure of the body of your soil. But through that year, as it breaks down, it will start releasing nutrients back. As it breaks down, it releases nutrients back to your soil. Alfalfa is an awesome product to put into the soil. Phosphorus is there, even though with high alkaline soils, you have phosphorus locked up. But we'll get to that, too. But it has a lot of nutrients in it that your plants will use in so alfalfa is a great source. If you're mowing lawns, and probably not a lot of people are mowing lawns, but that grass has good value as well. Compost materials and put actively breaking down material into your fields, into your garden, wherever you're working. Starting from the very smallest, your planter beds, your raised bed, start incorporating that. And as you do, you're changing the structure, you're changing the, you're changing the body of your soils, putting, see, there's a gentrification cycle that, that works, a breakdown, a cycle that's, that, that's just in nature. God has created bacteria. Do you realize on this planet there's more living organisms at your feet than there are above the ground? Soils are loaded with fauna either meso or macrofauna, either the, your, your uh, earthworms being your macro, your, largest, your larger items that are cutting up and, and breaking down and, and bringing organic matter to sizes smaller so that your mesofauna, as it breaks down, they can start converting. Because everything began at one stage with the proteins, the phosphorus, the potassium, all those ingredients are there, they're breaking them down and rendering them back again so that they can be used over. It's a recycling process that's happening in nature. So that's all you're doing is you're participating in that recycling process by using the, the trees, the leaves, the, the plants that are growing, using them back, putting them back into your soil so that those nutrients are available for your plants as they're growing. And it's nice because as you do it, whatever you've done this year is appreciated more next year. And as you add 
that next year you just keep that cycle moving. Pretty soon you've got soils that are just tremendous. The acid, the alkaline issues that you have in your soil, we're gonna we're gonna deal a lot with that heavily on Sunday. But let me just touch on it right now. The pathway to climb over that, the gentleman has suggested that elemental sulfur can be used in it, and it's an effective tool to bring your acids down. It has to be combined with organic matter, but it's a slow process of changing your pH levels. There's a faster way, there's faster ways of doing it, it costs you more money. to bring that pH level down. Um, I've got some materials that I will make available for you. There's companies that, that have um, a buffering solution that goes into your water. Now also, let me see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna digress just a little bit. If you're, if you're doing soil samples on the, on the area where your roots are, or taking up nutrients in your soil, I don't know if too many people here are farming hydroponically, so you're just using media. But always find out where your water is at. Because oftentimes, you may have an area where your pH in your soil is not the 8.5 that someone brought out today, my sister here. But it may be in a 7, it may be maybe, you know, 6, 8, but you've got water that has a tremendous pH load to it. And you may need to also address the water that you have, but for the water that you're using. So it's, it's, it's a combination connection that you need to do is to check your water as well as check your soils for where your pH balance is there. So, you, so, so one isn't countering the other. Um, there are some things in your kitchen that you use that will change your pH. Um, especially for those that are growing organically. Anything that's acidic is going to work against the alkaline, vinegar, citric acid, top-loaded, those things will work against the alkalinity. Now, anytime you have soils that are, that are full of soluble, Salts or salts that will that will readily dissolve and to move into your water, because most of the uptake in plants happens with water. Nitrogen is a is a ion that is negatively charged. It moves with water. Magnesium is another one. So if you're those are those are moving with your water in your plants, so they're mobile inside the plants, they're mobile in your soil. And I'll come back to that one a little bit later in terms of how we apply our nitrogen, how we, you know, how we apply some of our nutrients. Um, there are more efficient ways of doing it. But to say this, that since water is a mechanism that your plants use to transfer and to move nutrients through it, you certainly want to make sure that your water is not creating your barrier for you, as well as your soil. I've got my things right in the soil, but yet my water is working against me. Check your water, check your soil, to see where you're at with your pH. Now with your soil. Sulfuric acid, it's available commercially. It will change your pH same day you apply it in your soil. Um, aluminum sulfate, same day. It will change within hours. It changes your pH levels. and makes them where they're manageable. Only, the only problem is these are more expensive tools to use. But if you're, you're farming smaller areas, maybe it's manageable. Maybe it's something that you can do. Um, top, top loading some of your other some of your other products would be a would be something that would be worth considering to do. Um, I'll have cut sheets, I'll have brochures, I'll have 
um, information about the products on Sunday that you can you can take with you. You have to keep your files at home, and then you can go to some of the places like um, another one is uh, sulfur sulfur dioxide. I think there's another one that that will work well. But I'll have that information for you. Do you know if any of you in your area you have um, a nu aggregate nutrient? Nutrient Ag Solution Company. They used to be Crop Production Services. These are these are houses that your farmers work out of to get products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, anybody you know that's farming commercially that that shops from those places or that trades with them. If there is, those are those are areas where you can get products. Um, if not, maybe we can probably plug you into a resource um, that, can, that can help with that. Your Home Depots and Lowe's, they won't carry the things I'm telling you about. So we'll have to do it another, we'll have to go about it another way. But certainly over time, sulfur and organic matter are going to bring your pH levels down in your soil. Because as they, as they change, they create sulfuric acid. That's, that's going to start adjusting and bringing your pH levels down to where your plants can, can do well, can do better. Um, critical, critical piece there. But as farmers, you want to always be amending, amending, amending every year, <laughs> amending your soil as you begin. Amend, put materials in your soils. Um, worm castings, that's another great tool that you can use for amendment. Anybody raising worms or growing worms or anybody doing that? Um, okay, that's that's another that's another pathway. Your worm castings are, are great great items to use uh, for that. Now, now William Harrison mentioned in his in your raised beds you've got soil that's unusable. Hmm? Clay soils tend to present themselves as unusable because as they as they hydrate or they or water or, or they or water leave them as water leaves them as they hydrate they seem to be more malleable more workable but as soon as as soon as they dry out you've got a stone almost to work with but the same principles with your other soils with sand soil start adding one to one, two to one, because you've got you've got fine fine silk. There's twelve classes of soil, twelve twelve textural classes of soil. And clay and silt are, are are two that are that are tremendously difficult because they don't allow oxygen in their in their strata or in their if, if I've got a layer of clay, the aeration in that soil is next to none. And it's critical that your plants have oxygen at the root. So how do I take, um, how do I take something that's really, really dense, really, really packed and tight and loosen it? I've got to incorporate something in it that's going to maintain that first it's it's once it's once it's brought into it it's going to maintain that that body change to the to the silt. You've got to don't put sand. You'll have wonderful bricks there. But but use organic matter. Horse manure. Use your decomposing compost. Start one to one Harrison start putting organic matter into that into, into those beds. Work it in, incorporate it really, really, really well. Your first season, you may not see a, a, a dynamic change. If you go one to one, you will see a change. In every other season, you're going to continue to change the body of that soil, and you'll have something that you can work with, even your first year. But you, you've got to incorporate a lot because you've got a lot of dense material.
I'm, I'm sure the stores and the places that are that are eliminating materials like that, I'm sure that they wouldn't be objectionable to someone picking them up as long as those coming to pick them up were responsible in how they handled them. It didn't create a liability situation for them. Sure, sure, sure. Um, perhaps addressing management first would be to say, hey, listen, we're part of this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we'd like to compromise this product. Um, no, I don't, I don't think it's uh, probably not so much the fact that they don't trust the Navajo, is that a lot of stores are bound with, with liability issues. If, if you take that product and you sell it to someone, you give it to someone to eat, they say, where'd you get it from? It came from this place. Well, the legal, the legal stream is going to be, let's find the deep pockets. Let's keep chasing this thing back down the line until we find out who we can get money from. So go to management and plead your case with them, and then hear from them what will release them of any liabilities if you picked up that product. They can give you the path forward that their company will be satisfied with, so you can come and get their pick up their products and use it. I think that would be a constructive way to, 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 to look at it. Um, so clay soils, organic matter we want to incorporate in. Also, another another, um, and we'll have this cut sheet for you available tomorrow as well. I talk just briefly about the soil fauna. Micro elements that are in your soil. Um, these are there are fertilizers that are loaded with microbial bacteria that you can add to your soil to increase the numbers, the populations, and the activity of that breaking down and releasing and, and making available to your nutrients that are in the soil. So that's another tool that you can use as a gardener is to use a microbial bacteria infused fertilizers or nutrients. There's a company that, that does it very, very well and you'll, I'll have their materials for you tomorrow. It's called BioGo365. You can Google them. Um, it's organic, certified by OMRI and they, it's, it has a tremendous population of microbial bacteria, and it, and it works. I've used it for, it's called BioGrow 365. I've used it for a number of years, uh, and it's, it, it works. Sometimes you'll put seedlings out, and they'll just sit in the ground because they're not either uptaking the way they want to or the, or the way they need. If you, it's a, it's a, very condensed material. You add so many teaspoons to a gallon of water, you add it, you make two or three applications, most of those seedlings or those plants will start taking off. You'll find the bacteria will work and do its work and, and you'll be moving with it. So, so there's a one thing that's needed in, that's really nice in the farming industry. Things are always changing. There's always new ideas being added, new materials that are being created to make your work easier and your byproduct nicer. I want to, like I say, on Sunday we'll dig in deeper on when it, when it comes to the uh, dealing with the pH issues. Because they're really, alkaline issues, pH issues are really, really serious. They will stop you cold. Plants, seedlings won't germinate, plants won't grow like they should. Um, another area also is um, metals, heavy metals in the soil. I don't know if anybody's had, anybody's ran into the, into that area where you've got a lot of heavy metals, and lead. Any farming, any air, oftentimes in areas where farming has been done for a long time, you end up with um, 
areas where you've got a lot of lead in the soil. Um, some areas cadmium will be high, some areas you have a tremendous amount of iron in the soil. Um, oftentimes those heavy metals will bring you issues as well. But if you don't have those problems, awesome, you won't have to talk about it. Because, but there are ways to remediate those soils. Either with plants, um, typically with chemicals, is a, it leaves you with an outcome that's even worse. But you can actually use plants to do that bioremediation and bring those heavy metals out of your soil. Now, an area that, that I have a passion for was mentioned by William. And it's gardening in a cooperative fashion. It's cooperative gardening. Gardening as a group, gardening as a, um, as a club. There's an example that um, that we have in our area, because I'm, I'm in Nevada, I'm a long way from you guys. But in Sacramento, California, there's a farmer's market on, at J Street, and it's underneath the freeway. Big, big farmer's market. All your commercial farms are there, and flowers, honey, fruit, everything is in that, in that market. Just up the street from it, maybe two blocks, less than, less than two blocks, is an Asian farmer's market. And you will be shocked when you walk into that farmer's market, the bouquet of vegetables and everything that they have. And most of the ladies and the men that are, that are growing, that are growers there, they're doing it in the backyard of their house. They don't have big acreage. They're just, they're doing it in their backyard and they bring all that produce together into this farmer's market. And it's, I tell you, people, people love it. They'll go from J Street and you have to stop at that one to get all the things that they've grown in just a variety of strains. And as, as, as groups, it's a neat thing to do because let's say, for instance, she can do beans at her house. You've got enough land to do all the corn. This one wants to do, I can do this variety of winter squash at my place. And, and as you go through the room, the assignments are given to different ones to grow this or to grow that or to grow this or to grow that. Or I like growing this, and I can do it very, very well. And you bring all those products together for a farmer's market or just for a harvest celebration. And everybody takes what they can take, everybody takes it, and everybody leaves with food for the whole year for their homes. Because you grew together. And the things that I couldn't grow, you grew, and you're sharing amongst yourselves everything that you grew, but your, your, your bouquet is full. That's a way of growing so that everybody at the end of the year has, when winter comes around, everybody has exactly what they would like to have and don't have to go purchase. But it's also a great way of doing it for the marketplace, is farming cooperatively that way. There, probably in every major town, there are places called co-ops. They sell in those places a bouquet of vegetables and fruits that are coming from farmers all over. That's how their business structure is. They do buy from commercial suppliers, but a lot of what they do because their customers are looking for local product. And that's, that's an awesome advantage that every one of you sitting in this room has. Right now, the majority of the consumers are looking for products that are grown locally. And the local signature is 250 miles. If she lives 250 miles away, she can bring product to her market and it will be labeled as local because that's allowable. I've farmed commercially for, for years. As a child, I think I got the bug from, uh, from uncles, my grandfather, uh, did soybean and cotton in Louisiana. And we would, we would be there every other year. So my brothers were born there. So, 
I've always loved that atmosphere. My uncles were sharecroppers, and one of my grandfather's brothers, he was had 80 acres he farmed on, on land in Louisiana. And then coming to the West Coast, if there was a garden to be done, I was always in the middle of it. But commercially, I bought a farm up in Tenasket, Washington, and farmed eight varieties of commercial pears, organic nuts, soft fruit, and organic produce. Bought semi-trucks, semi-truck and trailers, and, and straight trucks to bring that product down to farmers' markets in Seattle and then into Port Oregon to open up markets and to find markets there. After coming to Nevada, continued with commercial farming and doing that for the Rayleigh stores in our market. And they couldn't get enough of the product. And their goal was as a store is to bring what the farmer's market had to their shelves. Because if they do that, then their customers don't have to go to the farmer's market. There's a tremendous, tremendous pull for local product. Let me give you an example. Cucumbers, we grow all of our cucumbers vertically, and I hope a lot of you are doing vertical growing. Are you? Yes? She's shaking her head yes. Those, anybody else that's not, let's get your feet wet and let's start doing some vertical growing. I'll, I'll show you some examples and some photographs of it, but it's a lot less space consuming, easier to harvest, and even better for your pollination. But we were doing cucumbers about every harvest, of cucumbers, I'm about 800 pounds of cucumbers per, per harvest, and that's twice a week. Every Tuesday, every Thursday, 800 pounds of cucumbers. And the stores are receiving them as quickly as you can bring them because they're 13 stores. So that wasn't enough, actually. If we had 2,000 pounds of cucumbers or more, then we would have been able to satisfy the stores because they were willing to take their Mexican product out of the store to run the local now, there's a larger farm than us there at 2,000 acres without a fresh pack. They're doing organic cucumbers. The price point on the organic cucumbers was $1.49. We were at 79 cents on the retail. The Mexican product is a little bit less than that. The stores are usually always willing to pay more for a local product than they will for the conventional product coming from Mexico or wherever else it's coming, just because they know their customers want the local. So as a result, it's 79 cents for a local cucumber, and we're farming them organically. We just didn't put an organic label to it. We sold circles around them in volume. And then we were blessed with a problem that hit the market that E. coli was found in cucumbers coming from Mexico that made a broad sweep over the market. Now the stores are like, can you bring us twice a week about six or 700 pounds of cucumbers every store? Can you bring us that volume? Well, we didn't plan for that volume, but the market was there. And I'm sharing that with you is to say that, that for a local product, you have a market as soon as we can get water nailed down and get that issue out of there, you have a market that's waiting for you. Farm to market, farm to store, farm to restaurant, farm to school. Those are initiatives that are moving and are moving with strength right now. So that window is tremendous. There's no reason why if land is available, if water is available, and if manpower is available, that Farmers can't be making and doing very, very, very well. The more unique you are in what you grow, and and our sister here, um, Lavana, am I pronouncing your name correctly? No. This, yes? Okay. Um, but I'm thinking of the lady behind you, Cora. You're growing things that are, you, you're, 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 you're bringing yourself out of the box. You're pulling yourself, being willing to pull yourself out of the box. And as a farmer, you must do that. Find areas that are making money and doing well, and do them well, because those will always be, those will be your, 
those will be your guarantees. These ladies have told me about the, 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 the white corn and the different things that they're selling and drying, that you've got people not even in the farmer's market, they, they, know you're, they know you're around, they know you exist, and they know you have it, and they're coming to you. Those are your, those are your core, that's your core money. But now as soon as you reach out and start looking around you to see, okay, I wonder what's being sold other places? There's restaurants in a city that's 200 miles away from me, two hours, three hours away from me, one hour, hour and a half away. There's supermarkets there. It's going into a supermarket and having a talk with the produce manager and saying, you know, I really like your produce. Things look really, really nice. What do you find in, your, in, 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 in what you carry that you can't get enough of? And they'll be real open with you. They'll say, well, you know what? We have radicchio maybe for two weeks, and then it's gone. We've got rhubarb for only three weeks in the year, and we can't see rhubarb. But our customers are calling for rhubarb, so they can do pies, and they can do this, and they can do that. They'll tell you, as soon as October hits, I lose all my cucumbers. I've got no more local tomatoes. I've got no more of this, I've got no more of that. They'll be really straightforward with you to let you know oftentimes what they have or what they don't have in the store. Now it may be that you can't afford to build a greenhouse to greenhouse to, to, to do that production straight through the winter when it's 10 degrees outside, snow on the ground, or when it's at zero degrees. But what you can do with a, with a high tunnel or with a cold frame is you can stretch the shoulders of your market. You can begin earlier with a cold frame, and you can certainly extend when everybody else frost has hit them. Frost cover cloth is available to a six degree increment. What I mean by that is if frost, cut, if frost hits at 31 degrees, if I apply a frost cover cloth, it's going to give me a boost of 6 degrees. Does that make sense? Everybody? Okay. If I apply two layers of frost cover cloth, that gives me 12 degrees. There are people that will grow through the winter lettuce under frost cover cloth two layers, one layer depending on where they're at so it doesn't freeze. And it's cold tolerant, but they can still do lettuce for the market in a cold frame under cold under frost cover cloth and still present good products to the market. One year we grew um, mini peppers. And mini peppers shocked me because we had peppers when it was hard frost under frost cover cloth that were still presentable, that were still snappy, they were crisp, and they're ready to go to the market. Oftentimes as a grower you have to stretch the rubber band and just see what maybe not with not when I say stretching the rubber band, stretching stretching to see what will happen or what will not will not happen. What what I can win with, what I can't win with how far I can go into the winter protecting plants and still be able to present them as good product. Just experiment and, and try the edges of things. Let's say for instance, corn, I don't plant, I'm gonna stop planting all my corn in July. And I don't plant anymore because I know if I plant in July, by the time October comes, frost and cold's gonna hit me, or freeze will hit me, and my corn's not gonna make it. All right? Rather than accepting that as a rule, say, okay, well, this year I'm gonna plant two rows in July. And I know normally frost is gonna catch me, but what I'll do this year is when August, when September comes, and I know I'm gonna get, get to a point of, of threat, They've already tasseled, and the corn has already been pollinated. Cut those tops off, and then.
then drape the plant with a, a frost cover cloth to protect it. Corn's a grass, so it, it can handle a little bit of cold by itself. Yeah. It'll handle a little bit of cold. It's just those, and those kernels are protected in the husk. So it may be very well that you can take your white corn and get into your cold area and still have something fresh that you can bring to your market. You've got to be willing to take a gamble and learn on some of the products that you're going to see. Not maybe one or two or three plants, maybe a row, a half a row, a quarter of a row, and just test where the edges are and see if you can't see how you see how you do. As a market gardener, that's as a farmer, that's those are just places of those are just places of experiment. And it and sometimes they pay off and they pay off very well. Yeah. Yes. Corn can freeze. If you if you're at 27s, 26, 25s, 32 is nothing. Oh my goodness. Yeah, 32 is nothing because it, it'll actually it'll take a frost hit. Corn will take a frost hit and come right out of it without any problem. You know, it'll it'll come. Yeah, it'll it'll come right, and you won't you won't have you won't have much either. You won't have something that you can't use. But but try it and see. Test it and see. Test and see how that works. So now for you, if your last planting, say the last planting is mid-July, mid 15th of July, we cut off all of our planting. That's our last plant. Put some in at the end of July. So I'll put in a half a row at the end of July and just see what happens. Task them. You want to make sure that one has finished, and the, and your dry and your and your, uh, your your tassel is on your corn is kind of drying down, so it won't receive any more. Say that again. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, the, the cutting them off is so that you can cover the plant nicely with a cover cloth. If you're collecting the pollen, now you no, no, no. Um, 20 rows, okay. Do you realize, um, it, it depends, again, it, it depends on how, how, how much how much input you put into a product has a lot to do with how much you get out of it, dollar value wise. It may not be, the numbers may not add up for you to protect 10 rows if it costs you too much to, to engage with that protection. But there are farms that grow blueberries and they grow them in climates like this where the sun is sharp and it's hard in the summertime. They have 20 or 30 acres covered with shade cloth in the field because the product is that valuable. So you've got to do the math at home to say, okay, is it, is it, am I going to get enough out of it to make this investment, to do this, to stretch it, to make it longer? But what I'm encouraging you to do is just for your knowledge, do 10 plants, do 5 plants, and just see what happens. Realize your, your pollen is only good for just a short window in your corn, right? Yeah. So if you can have tassels on your plant that have no value because the pollen's already out of them, the flowers have bloomed, the, you know, they've released the pollen, and they're just there, but they're in your way. To protecting that cob, because your focus now, I want to protect that cob. I want to keep, I want to, I want to take the frost hit Frost it off of it. If the cover cloth can take the hit, then my corn cob.
job won't take it. And if I double it, they'll take a double hit, etc. Et so, so you got to do that math and just see what what you know what really makes sense. Um, but market gardening or gardening for the market um, can be can be an awesome something because there's there's a reception there's a reception there. William, if you can get your um, church members to participate in the growing um, and, the, and in that market, it's 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 a, it's a doable it's a doable something. Yeah. One thing that um, one thing that's requested of us. Um, let me share it. Let me share it this way. If if you're watching, if you're watching the news, are you keeping up with current events most of the day? Kind of watch the news. Harrison, you do. Okay. Um, have you? Anybody have an old rusty King James Bible at home? Anybody carry those things around? William says he does. Ladies, any of you have one of those King James Bibles around? Okay. All right. I say rusty because they pick up a lot of dust. But valuable history. You know, most of your historians, most of your secular individuals will tell you that history is always repeating itself, right? You know that as a principle? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you understand history, if you fail to understand history, you could, you'll be caught in that vortex of slamming into what already happened when you can miss it. There's just certain things that are just going to keep, keep moving. That King James Bible tells us that. But you don't have to go to the Bible. You can go to the library and get that information. That history repeats itself. So I'm saying that to say this, current events. Over half of the seed in the United States of America and worldwide now, is held today by about four or five companies. So what does that mean? They, they spend a lot of money in seed. Stupid, huh? Hmm? Henry Kissinger made a statement that if you control oil, you control the nations. If you control the food, you control people. If companies have found that it's critical to invest money in seed, it's not about your well-being. It's about profit. And it's about controlling people. God has told us that in that old King James Bible. The spirit gods that others recognize in their cultures have given wisdom because wisdom comes from one source. They've given wisdom to people to do this or to do that. And you, 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 you just can't ignore that. So why am I saying all of this? Is that it's critical that as informed, enlightened individuals that being self-sustaining, learning how to save seed, learning how to do it properly and be a certified seed grower or handler is of tremendous value because there's an assault on those that are just saving seed. You know, for generations in, com in countries, people have always grown corn. I take the best corn cob and I set it aside. Some of the best corn cobs, I take them. They're the, they're the fullest, they're the biggest. I set those aside and replant them next year. But there's an assault to say that the individuals that are doing that are spreading disease because they're not doing it the way we do it. They haven't gone to school, they've taken their courses, they, they've not learned this, they've not learned that. So basically what they're doing is they're disease spreaders. Now, there's a way to climb over those voices, is by learning how the conventional methods are being done and the commercial methods are being done, and then certifying yourself at that capacity so that now we're doing it as a business, we're doing it as certified individuals, whether you're selling a huge volume or not, but it's just a tremendous way of amongst yourselves 
being self-sustaining with your own seed and maintaining your own seed and your own seed strains so that you always have them. Hybridization of seed has good points and it has, it has points on pros and cons. For indigenous peoples and living in different areas, it was a death nail because they always saved their seed. And then when the market meant that now I must come to the market and purchase, if it happened that since they're subsistence farmers that are growing with the rain, that the rains didn't last long enough, and now I lost my crop, and I purchased, put hard money down to purchase, I don't have no more money to go buy more seed. So now I'm, I can't eat that year, or now I'm on my back when it comes to being able to be available to have this or have that. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a critical feature that we think about in the back of our mind, somewhere put it there, that we want to move to the place of being self-sustaining with what we're doing. I want to always have my seat.